Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we start with the epic fail of mainstream media's Fukushima coverage with Professor Celine Marie Pascal of American University in Washington, D.C. By the way, that's not Professor Pascal's opinion. She's got data and footnotes to prove her point. We'll also have a report from nuclear hot seat European correspondent Sean McGee on the impact of a recent BBC Panorama documentary on the UK's Sellafield nuclear facility, in which whistleblowers reveal dangerous safety problems and decaying infrastructure. And I'll tell you a bit about what transpired at the Excellence in Journalism conference, including a surprise bit of audio when I asked a question of an internationally respected Pulitzer Prize-winning editor on the place of balance in advocacy journalism. Plus, our numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report for what's gone wrong this week with those aging rust buckets, and more honest nuclear information than the people sitting next to me on flights going to and from excellence in journalism ever expected to hear. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 20th, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from a different perspective. First, this breaking story out of Japan, sent by nuclear engineer Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds.org. A typhoon has hit Fukushima, and TEPCO admits that it has lost control of radioactive groundwater. On September 21st, and remember Japan is one day ahead of the United States time zones, so this is happening right now. TEPCO announced that because of the heavy rain caused by the approaching typhoon number 16, the groundwater level at the ocean side of Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plants rose to the same level as the ground surface because of the possibility that contaminated groundwater mixed with the rainwater has poured into the Pacific Ocean. TEPCO is going to be analyzing the surface water as well as the seawater. That's the bulletin. We will have further details on next week's program. Here in the U.S., a new peer-reviewed study finds rising infant death rates in the past 25 years in zip codes surrounding the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. According to this study, a remarkable and statistically significant 28% overall increase in infant mortality rates occurred in the coastal strip group relative to the inland control group. The study is by Dr. Christopher Busby and appears in the peer-reviewed Jacobs Journal of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine. Dr. Busby's study found that, quote, the increases over the period correlate significantly with cumulative releases of tritium from the nuclear plant to the sea. He continues, furthermore, during this same period, infant mortality rates fell for the whole of California and for the local inland control group in the county, providing additional evidence that federally approved routine radiation releases from U.S. nuclear power plants damage infant health. We'll have a link up to the story and the study on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 274. In Plymouth, Massachusetts, the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station is finally back on full power after problems forced it to be shut down for 12 days. What kinds of problems? Starting back in August, operations at the facility were stopped for four days for repairs following the failure of a main steam isolation valve. There was an unplanned shutdown on Tuesday, September 6, after water levels unexpectedly spiked in the reactor pressure vessel. On Friday, September 9, while the plant was still in shutdown, there was a leak of 2,680 cubic feet of hydrogen gas in the turbine room, which then got released into the atmosphere. 
Then on Tuesday, September 15, as the station was slowly powering up, it reached only 9% of its full capacity before a turning gear that helps spin the turbine and maintain its proper balance was found to be not functioning properly. That same week, Plymouth Fire Chief Ed Bradley said Energy Corporation, which owns and operates Pilgrim, not only did not notify the fire department of the hydrogen release at the plant as it is required to do, but that the company filed a false report on the matter. It's no wonder that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has listed Pilgrim as one of the three worst-run nuclear reactors in the country. Entergy has said that they are planning to shut the plant down as of 2019. They should just shoot it now and put it out of its misery. There's a demo planned for tomorrow, September 21st, at the Massachusetts State House regarding this matter, and we'll have more information about that during Activist Shoutout. More reactor news in the nuclear hot seat duck <laughs> and cover report. At Davis Bessey in Ohio on September 16, the facility went into hot shutdown because something called essential buses were not aligned to power transformers during plant startup. This issue is being reported as a loss of safety function of the essential electrical buses. <laughs> At Comanche Peak in Texas on September 15, it was discovered that the emergency core cooling system centrifugal charging pump discharge pressure gauge, boy, that's a mouthful, it was discovered that the diaphragm seal utilizes a Teflon gasket, and Teflon is a restricted material normally prohibited from use in contact with reactor coolant or in radiation environments. Teflon is not radiation tolerant and significantly degrades in a radiation environment. Teflon was discovered on all four of the centrifugal charging pumps and both of the positive displacement charging pumps on both Units 1 and 2. And Luminant Power, which currently owns and operates the facility, believes that the Teflon has existed in the pressure gauges since the initial plant licensing. <laughs> At Salem in New Jersey on September 16, hydraulic fluid, or fish oil, was spilled caused by a leak from the crane used to rake debris from the Unit 2 trash racks. <laughs> At Dresden in Illinois on September 19, it was discovered that control room emergency ventilation charcoal was not meeting acceptance criterion, and this results in the inoperability of control room emergency ventilation. <laughs> And even California's dead-in-the-water San Onofre facility on September 19 notified the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board in regards to an oily wastewater release into the environment in excess of allowable limits. 1,500 gallons was released into the Pacific Ocean. And that's this week's nuclear reactor duck <laughs> and cover report. Two whistleblowers from the Hanford site in eastern Washington, one of the most polluted places on the planet, have been awarded $216,000 in back pay and compensation plus interest and attorney's fees after having been suspended from their jobs by Computer Sciences Corporation for raising safety concerns related to a medical tracking system. They were then laid off. At least now they've got some compensation. And at Rocky Flats in Colorado, if you owned property near or downwind from the former Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant as of June 7 of 1989, up to 15,000 Rocky Flats neighbors may be eligible for settlement money in the suit, which was filed against the plant's operators, Rockwell International Corporation and Dow Chemical Company, for devaluing the neighbors' property values. Eligible for compensation are the owners, the heirs, and successors of an entity that owned the property. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of the week. U.S. Senator Lamar Alexander, a Republican from Tennessee, leads the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee overseeing federal energy and water funding. On Thursday, September 15, Senator Alexander said that nuclear power is, quote, 
Our nation's best source of pollution-free electricity. Well, I guess you don't consider those pesky plutonium-filled fuel rods just sitting there in the spent fuel ponds as pollution, do you, Senator Alexander? Why, they're not spent at all, just hot and lazy and taking a soak in the pond after putting out a little bit of energy. And they're not looking to leave, mm -mm, just like those relations who come for a short visit. Maybe they prove marginally useful for the first day or so, but then they stick around forever, like uranium tailings from mining, fuel rod manufacturing, and radioactive waste from what's left of those fuel rods after six years at most, because that's all they last, and then they become deadly radioactive waste with a hot half-life of 24,000 years. Mm -mm -mm. Yep, they're just like your wife's cousin Earl, permanently ensconced on your couch, and never moving out, and smelling up the whole house with his... Well, you know what Earl is like. Hygiene is not his strong suit. So if you don't think your home is pollution-free with Earl making that much stink, you better believe that nuclear energy isn't pollution-free either, Senator Alexander. Not with that plutonium stinking up our planet with radiation that can kill and will last and be deadly four times longer than history itself has been recorded. And that's why, Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. On the website, we will have links to some great articles on informed consent, what communities need to know about interim nuclear waste storage, threats, from the plan to ship high-level radioactive waste to Texas and New Mexico, and how the nuclear accident at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, on Valentine's Day of 2014, will end up costing U.S. taxpayers $2 billion to fix, and no matter what Energy Secretary Ernest Money says, will not be completed by the end of 2016. Over to the U.K., where researchers have found mutational signatures which appear to indicate changes to DNA specifically caused by exposure to ionizing radiation. This is huge because it is first to show the damage radiation inflicts on DNA and may allow doctors to identify tumors caused by radiation. We will have more on this story in the coming weeks. Over to Japan, where employees of the operator of the troubled Manju prototype fast breeder nuclear reactor in Fukui Prefecture say the reactor is a failure or criticize the project in other ways, according to a labor union survey. Over half the respondents said the government should consider decommissioning the trouble-plagued reactor. A group consisting of medical and legal experts announced on Friday, September 9, that it has launched a fund to help Fukushima thyroid cancer patients cover their expenses. The group, named 311 Children's Fund for Thyroid Cancer, 311 being March 11 of 2011, the day of the earthquake and tsunami which began the Fukushima nuclear disaster, is aiming to raise 20 million yen, or about $200,000 U.S. And we will link to an article, Radioactive Food and Water, The New Normal in Japan, it's written by Dr. Richard Wilcox, Ph.D. In the U.K., the British government has given approval for the Hinkley Point nuclear power station to move forward, financed in part by Chinese and French companies. Estimated cost, close to $24 billion. A report from the University of Sussex in England and ETH University in Zurich, Switzerland, show that there is a risk of another Chernobyl or Fukushima-type accident plausible sometime in the relatively near future. We'll have a link up to the full article, but know that two of the top 15 most expensive nuclear accidents in the world happened in the United States, Three Mile Island and Athens, Alabama, in 1985, and four of them occurred at Sellafield in the U.K. And an update from Dr. Timothy Mousseau, who has been researching mutations in insects, birds, and mice on the ground in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. He's in Chernobyl right now, and he writes, Radiation levels inside the red forest of Chernobyl have risen dramatically in areas burned by recent forest fires. 
There are several areas now showing one millisievert per hour, the highest I have ever recorded. It seems the ash from the fires has concentrated the radionuclides contained in organic matter, tree and leaf litter, that were consumed by the fire. Radiation levels in these areas mean that one can get an annual equivalent dose in two to three hours. It's hard to say how quickly these radionuclides will dissipate or what impact they will have on the flora and fauna. To which Nuclear Hot Seat adds, or on the researchers, Tim, on the researchers, take care of yourself. We'll have today's featured interviews in just a moment. But first, thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who donated to help me get to Excellence in Journalism, the conference presented by the Society for Professional Journalism. Whether you sent in a Starbucks donation, the best cup of coffee I will never drink, a monthly sustaining donation, or something else, know that I could not have gotten there without you. I'll tell you a bit about what happened during today's final thought. But for now, know that it was a powerful experience and that I could not have done it for you without you. Of course, we always have those pesky ongoing expenses as well as facing a bit of a shortfall with the conference. So don't go away. We're asking for you to continue to help us out by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and clicking on the big red Donate button. You can donate using PayPal with your credit or debit card, or if you prefer to write and send a check, you can get a snail mail address to use by sending an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. Again, I could not have done this trip without your support. So once again, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Professor Celine Marie Pascal of American University in Washington, D.C., is a sociologist who did a study of mainstream media coverage in the first two years after Fukushima. And not only are her observations stunning, she's got the data to back them up. This interview was originally presented on Nuclear Hot Seat number 203 on May 2nd of 2015. Celine Marie Pascal. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start out with giving the listeners a sense of your background. I'm a sociologist at American University, and I'm interested in issues of language and knowledge. I study language use to understand the kinds of assumptions that people make in their daily lives that often reproduce systems of inequality. What first got you interested in studying media coverage that took place in the wake of the start of the Fukushima nuclear disaster? I began noticing in my own casual reading that the media didn't cover the nuclear disaster in um, ways that I might have expected. And a little bit like what happened after Hurricane Katrina, that there was a way of reporting the natural disaster that really minimized what was going on and the social decisions that created the disaster itself around the levees. And so I wondered if something like that was happening with Fukushima, it seems like we weren't getting quite the whole story. From my perspective and that of people in the movement, we couldn't agree with you more. When did you start turning this into research and how did you proceed? Two years after the disaster, I began collecting newspaper articles, media coverage from the Huffington Post, Politico, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. I collected everything that they had printed about Fukushima in the two years between the start of my data collection, which was the second year anniversary, and the beginning of the disaster. What specifically were you looking for or looking at? As a sociologist, what I do is a systematic study to identify patterns. So I came into it thinking that it would be very interesting to look at how risk was constructed. How did these various media construct the notion of risk and how did it get particular kinds of meaning? And that began a really long coding process 
that um, I used En Vivo, which is a systematic online way of looking for where the word risk might appear or associated words, and then going from there more deeply into the articles to understand how they were being used, what was the context of their use. So when you say you were looking for risk, you were actually searching for that word in the context of articles and news stories about Fukushima? Exactly. There is so much data here that what I wanted to focus on for the first article out of this data is just the construction of risk with regard to the general population. I was really surprised when I saw how rarely that was discussed in the media. So I think that out of almost 2,200 articles just about, that there were really only 129 across all of these media that talked about risk to populations at all. That's shocking. The rest of it was risk to economies, risk to markets, risk to energy, but there were not really many articles at all that talked about the human aspect of this, except where workers were concerned. So it it made it seem like if you were not a worker, you wouldn't be at high risk. And what was your understanding of the actual risk that the population faced as a result of this disaster? I'm not someone who studies nuclear energy, and I'm not an expert on radiation. So I'm coming at this in a very odd way. I understand that what happened at Fukushima was far more devastating than what happened at Chernobyl, but I don't have the expertise to say what the consequences of that would be. I can only tell you how media represent the potential consequences. So, for example... Most of the articles that of that 129, 65 of them said, you know, the risk here is really low. You know, you are actually, and the New York Times ran an article saying, you're more at risk from radiation from rocks and cosmic rays from the environment than you are from anything happening at Fukushima. Well, you know, that's pretty shocking. That that's the kind of reporting that was going on. Of the articles that said, well, you know, there's some slow risk here, but, you know, we can't really say that much about it. They compared the risk of cancer to walking through the x-ray machines at airports, right, that that those were more dangerous than what was happening at Fukushima. One of the quotes that came from the article is that research shows that corporations and government agencies had disproportionate access to framing the event in the media. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I look across all of these articles, and I look at who's being quoted and in what context. So most of the time, you could find quotes from government officials, from various corporations, but what you really missed were quotes from people on the ground, from anti-nuclear groups, from organizations that are generally more critical of nuclear power. What do you think was behind this being the chosen narrative? Did it feel to you like it may have been a top-down decision, an edict from management or even higher government saying, play this down? Do you think it was ignorance on the part of the reporters to find contrasting views? Where do you think the failure to communicate more the seriousness of the risk came from? I couldn't say that there is a single point at work here. It certainly isn't a top-down. You know, in the U.S., we have a free media. You can report on whatever you want to report on. And yet, if you look at the dominant media outlets, they report the same stories in pretty much the same way every single day. You would think for that level of consistency that there was coercion somewhere. It doesn't work, that process in the U.S. doesn't work the same way that it might work in another country where there is literally a top-down coercive force. But rather, I think that it's a confluence of a lot of people who are involved in, who have access to the media, how we think about it. So of these 129 articles, only three of them were critical about this discourse of minimal risk. Three. So we have an original group of over 2,100 articles, 2,200 almost, 
and out of those, three are critical of how it's being reported. That's pretty shocking. That happens without someone coming through and saying, this is what you have to do, right? There's, there's a whole different process at work when corporate media, and here we have Huffington and Politico included in this, I was thinking that there might be something um, much more edgy, more, more confrontational there. Yeah, but it, no, that wasn't the case. We do know from certain private channels that certainly there was pressure put on the United States and the U.S. agreed to downplay the story. That came from a trade agreement that Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State signed approximately one month after the disaster began. I've also heard from private contact that there was pressure put certainly on national public radio, and I can't say the specifics on it, but certainly the will of the government was made known that it needed to be downplayed and that there were certain pressures put on that made it difficult for the reports to come out in, shall we say, a less biased and a more focused on risk kind of a way. In one instance, I know of a news reporter for an NPR station who was specifically told not to use the word fallout in connection with Fukushima. The word could only be used in connection with the repercussions of a political mistake that got made, like somebody showing their private parts on a cell phone photo. For those of us who are following the issue very closely and following the day-by-day, almost minute-by-minute progression of Fukushima in those early days, what was remarkable is that for about three days, there were a lot of reports in the U.S. media talking about the plume of radiation from Fukushima coming towards the United States, the West Coast, and that it was going to hit in approximately eight days. For about three days, we heard that story, and then it vanished. It was nowhere. The word plume was not used, and there was no discussion of radiation hitting the West Coast, even though we know from our own readings at the time that it did hit, and it was specifically very intense in the Seattle area where people were getting hot particles that were coming across from Fukushima. But it did not appear in the media after the third day. So it was suspected that something came down. We just haven't been able to nail with multiple sources so that it can be reported in a larger way what it was that actually happened. Um, well, I certainly found articles that reported that radiation from Fukushima was found in Vermont, articles that tracked that across the country. So I have a different experience. I, I'm not seeing that there's a blackout of news, but rather it's minimized. It's like no consequence. In a capitalist society where you don't have a police force, we're not controlled by military force, we're controlled by a certain kind of knowledge production. Uh, it began with the PR industry after World War I. It is through a construction of public knowledge that we have public order of a particular kind. And that's why I'm very interested in issues of knowledge production and power. In the articles that I've looked at, they're talking about, you know, these things happening, but they say it doesn't really matter. And one of the ways they say it doesn't matter is that, well, there's no real science. There's no hard science out there that will show us that this is going to have a negative effect. Well, science is always open to debate. It's not a science isn't necessarily a field where certainties rule, but the consequences of radiation poisoning are pretty well known. It's not that difficult, even though we don't have necessarily the specifics that map precisely onto Fukushima. I also found that there was languaging that was included in the minimization to subliminally direct people away from paying further attention. They would say that there was no immediate danger, that there was no significant exposure, with the words immediate and significant being key to this. And in truth about immediate, it takes so long for radiation exposure to manifest as some kind of an illness in the body that, in essence, they were literally correct, but they were giving a false impression that there was no danger. Yes. 
Did you find other languaging that was used consistently to turn people away from the disaster so that they weren't paying serious attention to it? Well, you as a reporter are able to infer a certain kind of intent, which I as a researcher can't do. So I'm not saying that they are reporting it this way in order to make people look another way. What I can tell you is that when you report on things in particular ways, it minimizes the interest, Or, it, but I can't really say what their intent was here. Does that distinction make sense? Yes, it does. We're coming at okay. it from two, from two particular perspectives on it, and that's just fine. The study goes on to point out how political disasters are and the efforts that go into controlling the narrative and the information the public receives. How do you see that continuing with the coverage of Fukushima? I think that the struggle for political power is present in the way that most everything gets reported. So one of the things that the literature on this shows us is that the more that we know about disasters, you would think we would take fewer risks. But instead, we end up increasing the numbers of risks that we take. We put ourselves at greater danger because the scale of risk-taking is increasing in leaps and bounds. So in the short, what happens is experts seem to have supplied a kind of confidence to take bigger risks. So the discursive production of risk in relationship to the general population relies on a kind of scientific uncertainty, and corporations and governments capitalized on this doubt about the presence of risk. And that results in a lot of ways to avoid responsibility. And, of course, it's easy to ignore radiation and its impact because it can't be perceived with any of the senses, and its impact takes place over time so that the distance between cause and effect is so great, it can be denied. Exactly. It's very, very hard to track. And also, there are specific forms of health problems. So if you're looking only at lung cancer, then it might not present very much of a risk. But if you think about diabetes, cataracts, heart problems that have come out of the studies from Chernobyl, then you're looking at something much more broad. And, of course, much more long-lasting because once the DNA is changed, once there's been genetic mutation, that's forever. Right, right. So how has this study been disseminated, and has there been any effort to get it into the hands of decision-makers in the media? I presented a paper on this research in Yokohama, which is about 50 miles south of Fukushima. And the article that you've referenced was written about that conference presentation. I'm in the process now of finalizing an article. I've had requests from a couple of journals to publish it in different places. I haven't decided yet where to place it. And are any of these journals dealing with journalism, with the actual field of news coverage? No, they're not. But I work, I'm an affiliate with our School of Communication and talk frequently with faculty and students there about the production of knowledge in news reports. Just simple, how we pick language changes everything. Simple words make a huge difference. Yes, they do. In your work with the School of Communication, have you used Fukushima as an example yet in any of your presentations? This is a new research project for me. I have worked with them mostly on uh, representations of race in media. So if they or really anyone, I know our community would be very interested, would want to access the study, how might they go about doing so? Well, first I have to publish it. (laughs) (laughs) You mean we're getting the jump on the gun on this one? You are. Because the article that you noticed came from a report on a conference presentation, not on a printed document, that's where we got into, we're kind of in a circle yet. But it it will come out soon. When you say soon, can you give me an approximate month on this? Yes, within a year. Interesting, because I'm a member of Sigma Delta Chi, the Professional Journalism Society, and every year they have a conference 
this is an ingathering of news directors, reporters, cable, broadcast, satellite for all of the United States and Canada, and usually it works at the same time with the Spanish language stations as well. It's a joint conference that gets held. And there are more than 1,000 media decision makers and on-the-ground reporters who are there every year. I attended two years ago. I'm hoping to be able to attend this fall again on behalf of this movement. It would be fascinating if your work could be brought to their attention in advance so that perhaps it would be a topic of conversation. That would be very interesting. What I'm finding in the media here is no different from what I found when I did media studies of reporting on homelessness, that the same sets of principles are at work. In what way? When articles about people who can't afford housing talked about, well, they, they very rarely talked about people who can't afford housing. They talked about homeless or the homeless. They used a certain kind of language that became part of a discourse that removed people from the reality of the experience. And very, very rarely did they ever interview people who actually were unable to afford housing. Instead, they interviewed people who had housing about how they felt about people who don't have housing. That's a very peculiar way to report on a topic, and yet that is a standard reporting practice in the U.S. And how did that play out in the coverage of Fukushima? In Fukushima, I haven't finished my data analysis to say with definitiveness, but what I'm seeing is that there is a kind of group think in how all of these things are reported. So you had asked about articles that were critical, and there was one in the New York Times, one in the Huffington Post, and one in the Washington Post. So it's not like there's one media outlet that's charging ahead, but that there's a little piece in all of them. It's just that the massive amount of reporting is following the party line, so to speak. It would just be so fascinating if you could get something published and available. It's mid-September in Orlando if you can get yourself down there, or if not, at least make it available. Have there been any reporters or news directors or members of the mainstream media who have gotten back to you even after this small article appeared? Well, I've gotten a lot of feedback from bloggers and other scholars, but no, not from mainstream media. It's going to be interesting to see whether any kind of noise can be made around your study. It's certainly going to be picked up by our side of the hill. It would be good to see if there's any kind of way to get it into the hands and the minds of those who are in charge of mainstream media to see if we can get better coverage because next year is the fifth anniversary. As you're probably aware, the media likes things that happen one year after and then it's in multiples of five. <laughs> and that's so logical. That's not covered for the years in between. Let's just go in five years. Five right. Years. right. So we've, we've got a real shot here. Do you have any thoughts to share that perhaps we have not gotten to? The single takeaway point for me is that all knowledge it, is a social process, right? And it's expressive of value judgments, of politics. There's a lot of contradiction in it. And that we have to look at all reporting as a, a construction of events. There is no such thing as news. We create news. And how we create that news how we give events particular presence and meaning in our lives is always a political struggle for power. That's my takeaway. Beautifully done. Celine Marie Pascal, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much. That was Celine Marie Pascal, professor of sociology at American University in Washington, D.C. The BBC's Panorama is a weekly investigative current affairs program, and two weeks ago it ran a devastating story on safety problems at the UK's Sellafield nuclear facility in Cumbria. 
whistleblowers, and Americans who worked for Nuclear Management Partners, the company that ran the facility from 2011 to 2013, spoke honestly about the poor infrastructure, decaying facilities, years of neglect, cracks and seepage in the 1950s-era concrete spent fuel pools. The list goes on and on. And it was quite a lot to be packed into a mere 30 minutes of broadcast journalism. Sean McGee, Nuclear Hot Seat's European correspondent, has been tracking Sellafield and has filed this report on some of the response to the Panorama program and why it's proving to be such a groundbreaking report. This is Sean McGee reporting for Nuclear Hot Seat and I'm based in Ireland and in Europe. What I'm going to talk to you this week about will be the recent Panorama documentary, which was on Sellafield, and it heralded in a new age of investigative journalism. For many years now, the BBC has been doing reports on nuclear issues. We find that they have been very pro-nuclear in their coverage, not looking at any of the problems or outlying issues. They will not cover it. And we had the Science Media Centre in the UK, who are now controlling science media for the press and TV. And they will give experts towards various programs to make comments on. But they're funded by corporate companies, you know, with the EDF. I think there's up to about 70 of these companies. They offer £5,000 each every year to fund the Science Media Centre. And this has been going on since uh, 2011, just after the Fukushima nuclear disaster in March of that year. And we saw a massive explosion in uh, the Science Media Centre's income. I've done an article for europeannewsweekly.wordpress.com with some interesting details of BBC cover-up and how that stretches to Fukushima and also how they ignore many independent scientists, such as CREERAD, which are a French environmental agency, and Bologna, who are the same in Norway. And they both are well regarded in their fields of nuclear waste and contamination issues, but have never been asked by the BBC for any comments on anything nuclear. And on top of that, we have many other independent experts who are available to the BBC, such as John Large, who actually the Panorama documentary did use, Ian Fairley, Tim Deer Jones, Chris Busby, and there are many other recognised experts. The BBC, they were running from last year a campaign to support the nuclear ticket, and this was in conjunction with EDF running a campaign in the schools to promote nuclear. And, of course, anything that's been brought up, such as a recent issue about UK scientists advising people to move back to highly contaminated areas off uh, Fukushima, the evacuation zone. And this was all dismissed, and it was a big outcry, but the BBC never really addressed this. They very quietly took down a video they put up and made a very short statement that there were some inconsistencies, nothing detailed, Also, the Panorama documentary itself, they put it onto the iPlayer, which is only accessible in the UK. But Panorama then put it up on their YouTube channel, and uh, that allowed people around the world to watch it, just as it was breaking in Ireland about the Sellafield issue, uh, Norway, Isle of Man. All the surrounding countries were starting to talk about it. It was in the press. And what happened after about a few hours was that the Panorama video, which was showing a lot of worried nuclear engineers who were whistleblowing and even more worried nuclear managers in Sellafield with lots of body language ticks and everything, and being proved to actually be part of a lying, non-transparent and very unsafe practice situation you know, in terms of working practice there. We were looking for some response, and the Science Media Centre hasn't even commented on this story, which has gone global. But if you go onto their website now, there is nothing since the end of last year. So 2015 was the last comment the Science Media Centre had to say about Sellafield. This is not in the interest of people. This is only in the interest of the corporations involved with Sellafield 
uh, which now, by the way, also include TEPCO, just to tie in the Japanese uh, situation. We find that there's an American company is now leaving the management of that area, and it's now becoming TEPCO and some other countries that will be doing it instead. The whistleblowers are saying it's in the right state. We have issues of transparency, and TEPCO are not renowned for their transparency. They've had to apologize a lot recently, but they're still keeping information back. And that we, we saw how that worked. It took 15 months for, for Parliament to be made aware of a, a major plutonium incident in Sellafield. Paul Dorfman is a science media expert who discusses nuclear issues in the UK on the mainstream outlets such as the BBC, on the Telegraph, the Times, various others. He's very well respected, even by the media. They respect his point of view. And he had to say to me on this, Recent events reveal the ongoing national disgrace that is Sellafield, including the truly appalling state of the historic spent fuel pools. And that's a quote-unquote from Paul Dorfman. Xavier Nast is a nuclear engineer, and he commented to me uh, very passionately about the response to seeing what was going on in Sellafield. Those plants, he said, Sellafield and La Hague, would exterminate the whole world population in under 40 years because there are 100-plus tonnes of plutonium in Sellafield and 60-plus tonnes in La Hague, adding 1,000 times more that necessary to exterminate all animals throughout the world. The biggest aberration of history, the timing bomb for the global extinction, a potential ashimothusia, which is actually means uh, sacrifices committed by force of the state. That was from Xavier, and he was just fuming about the general issues there and the fact they've just left that stuff lying about. So I think his preferred method would be getting those plastic bottles that we're mentioning, putting them to something a bit safer and burying them around about two kilometres underground, I believe his recommendation was. Carl Grossman, professor of journalism at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury, USA, he said to me that the BBC is guilty of a journalistic disgrace. That was Sean McGee, nuclear hot seat European correspondent based in Ireland. Sean has written an article in response to this Panorama program, and we'll have a link to it up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 274. And we'll have more from Sean in the coming weeks about Sellafield, the fallout, you should pardon the expression, from this Panorama program, as well as some political perspective on the U.K.'s recent decision to move ahead with building a $24 billion new nuclear reactor at Hinkley Point. Activist shout-out! Last week, Nuclear Hot Seat brought you breaking news about the arrest of three activists in the Massachusetts governor's office after they delivered a letter from Cape Downwinders demanding an immediate shutdown of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. The reasons, I'm certain, will be obvious because we covered them in an earlier part of this program. On Wednesday, September 21st, there is going to be, or there has been for those of you listening after the fact, a Close Pilgrim Now demonstration in front of the Massachusetts State House. To support the group, to support the issue, you are being asked to tweet using the hashtag ShutPilgrimNow. No spaces. Hashtag shut Pilgrim now. You can write your own message on the need to shut down Pilgrim or use this one, which we will post at Nuclear Hot Seat. Pilgrim nuclear dangers last two weeks. Emergency shutdown, gas and water leaks, malfunctions, no evacuation possible. Hashtag shut Pilgrim now. You see how it goes? Whatever you tweet, do it repeatedly because Twitter comes and goes real fast, and we need to keep it on the front-running edge of what's out there if we have any chance of trending at all. Always use the hashtag, ShutPilgrimNow. I just learned at Excellence in Journalism how media organizations track events in real time based on Twitter. By using this hashtag every time you tweet about Pilgrim, and doing so repeatedly, you have a greater chance of gaining coverage from mainstream media. Here's today's final thought. 
I just flew back from the Excellence in Journalism conference produced by the Society of Professional Journalists, where, yes, I met with reporters, news directors, representatives of regional news networks, special topic information providers, and school journalism departments, as well as their students. I talked about nuclear issues, how the media is taken out of stories by well-funded nuke industry PR, and the fact that they owed it to their listeners, viewers, and or readers to up their nuclear coverage. What I found gratifying was that, with very few exceptions, the news professionals I spoke with were interested, intrigued, and open to the information I was presenting. Depending on where they came from and the orientation of their news outlet, local, regional, or national, I gave them information they did not know about stories that perhaps they thought they knew eyes were opened, doors were opened, just a crack, and in some instances, solid connections were made. I found the experience profound. Rejoining such a robust community of journalists for the first time since college felt like a homecoming. This is what I was trained to do in the world, research, write, and report. It's what I do on Nuclear Hot Seat. After college, my first focus was on radio, then TV, and I got into print along the way, including the Boston Globe, L.A. Times, L.A. Weekly, Village Voice, and more. Then, many slippery life turns later, I was not in journalism, though its training informed all the other writing work I did. In rejoining this community of journalists, I feel like I've rediscovered a lost tribe of people who, quite frankly, I have missed. That's because it's the job of journalists to face reality, examine complex truths every day, then figure out how to explain what they've discovered so viewers, listeners, and readers can have a shot at understanding the world in which we live. They know how to ask questions and genuinely listen to the answers. In civilian life, this is called conversation, and it's a sadly degraded art form. Journalists know how to use English properly. What an apostrophe is, where it goes. What they write is far more thorough than mere Facebook rants or tweets. It's richer, more complex, and you can rely on the accuracy and thoroughness of their stories. But here's the thing. What I do on Nuclear Hot Seat is not traditional journalism. It's advocacy journalism. I have a point of view that I make obvious at the top of each program. I do not pretend to the he said, he said so-called objectivity. As the conference went on, I found myself wondering, am I somehow failing in my journalistic responsibility to report both sides of the story, even though as far as I'm concerned, there's only one possible stance to take on nuclear? I took that question to one of the most respected and important editors of our time, Marty Barron, now editor of the Washington Post, but formerly editor of the Boston Globe. He's the man behind the Globe's spotlight team that broke the story of the Catholic Church's cover-up of pedophile priests, a story which won him a Pulitzer and was turned into the Academy Award Best Picture-winning movie, Spotlight. He's the one who's played by Liev Schreiber. Marty Baron was the featured interviewee at Excellence in Journalism, and afterwards he made himself available for questions. So I asked him one. Before I play this brief clip, I need to make clear that in no way was Marty Baron speaking about nuclear issues, nuclear hot seat, or commenting on any story upon which I am working. What he said is not an endorsement nor a criticism of me, my work, or this show. We were discussing the practice and ethics of journalism when it comes to advocacy versus the assumption of the need for balance. I do a program on nuclear issues, and I've been doing this for more than five years, my own investigations on it. And where do you draw the line in terms of balance on an investigative story where there's clearly one side that there's information you're putting out, and if you ask the other side, what you would get is spin propaganda 
lies, and you can document the, the, the fact that they would be it would be false information coming back. Where does it change from balanced journalism? Is there a line where it becomes advocacy journalism? Right. Well, you know, let me make clear. I'm not taking any position on any particular story that you're working on because okay. I don't know what you're working on, so this doesn't apply, you know, to anybody, uh, any particular set of circumstances. So, uh, look, I mean, um, you know, we just have the obligation to do the reporting. I mean, and do as much reporting as possible, and to make sure that we've done it fairly, we've done it honorably, we've done it honestly, uh, we've done it thoroughly and and accurately, uh, and and to and to then look at all that reporting and tell us and determine what what are we to conclude from that. And if the evidence is overwhelming in one direction, then we should say that. Uh, now we want to give other people an opportunity to have their say, and we and it's very important that we always listen to what they have to say because we may start with a hypothesis, uh, but the hypothesis may be wrong, uh, and, uh, and they may also raise issues that we hadn't thought of before. So uh, I think we have to, um, you know. But ultimately, if we've done our job, if we've done it thoroughly, if we listen, uh, if we've listened attentively, if we've given people a fair opportunity to tell us everything, and then we've we've uh, checked all of that out, then we just have to report what we report what we found. Marty Barron, editor of the Washington Post, former editor of the Boston Globe, speaking about the art, practice, and craft of journalism. What I got from our brief exchange, whether he meant it that way or not, is that I need to keep doing what I've been doing while perhaps doing a bit more research into the nuke industry's rationales and reasons before I present the alternative perspective on nuclear issues. As I see it, my job is to provide you, the Nuclear Hot Seat listeners, with verifiable facts I've found that unspin the nuclear industry's well-known PR talking points, that I deliver the information as clearly yet entertainingly as I can, that I bring up stories that those who promote nuclear would rather we not think, let alone talk, let alone broadcast or tweet about, and provide you with both context and continuity on the nuclear issues that affect us all as well as the generations who follow. I plan to keep doing that and much more, hopefully in community with some of those gifted journalism professionals and students I met this past weekend. Stay, stay tuned. There will, there will be updates. This has been a Hot Seat for Tuesday, Tuesday, September 20th, 20, 2016. 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from World Business Academy, CapeCodTimes.com, Tri-CityHerald.com, BizJournals.com, WGNSRadio.com, TheBulletin.org, SeedCoalition.org, UPI.com, JapanTimes.co.jp, DailyMail.co.uk, Fukushima-Diary.com, ActivistPost.com, Dr. Timothy Musso via Facebook, BBC.com, Sussex.ac.uk, the National.scot, the Cubicle Slaves cranking out karma damaging press releases at World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the fantastic, passionate, highly motivated, and extremely good looking anti nuclear activists from around the world who gather at Nuclear Hot Seat on Facebook, where you are invited to join us and like us and share our posts with your family and friends. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is the alternative perspective on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that Nuclear Hot Seat is downloaded in 112 countries. So a lot of people have had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because... We are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. 
What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot sea. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.